Hello everyone, I'm Phil Miller with the New Mexico Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources. And this little tutorial and discussion is going to be about map topology. And one of the things that I'm going to start off right off the bat with is that we are going to be following the GEMS data model and regarding the GEMS data models use of topology. I also have some suggestions for uh, topology regarding an internal method that we use here at the New Mexico Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources. So this is a little bit of a hybrid discussion of the uh, use of topology and the effectiveness of topology and how it can be used to generate uh, quality digital geologic maps. One of the things that uh, we have to keep in mind with regard to that is a lot of this has a lot of exceptions. There are some best practices and there are some methodologies that can gain you effective use of your time on the back end relative to how you record your lines from the beginning, uh, especially when digitizing them in on photogrammetry or from field maps. A lot of this is going to be uh, kind of the best practices approach. I'm going to try and talk about some of the exceptions. And one of the exceptions that we have right off the bat is this map is uh, lacking uh, the complexity geologically of incorporating uh, faults in the area. So one of the things that I'm going to do probably at some point is go ahead and draw in a fake fault. Please mind that this is a fake fault. This is not reality. Uh, but I'm doing it for the purposes of discussing uh, topology, specifically the line topology. There are some things that come into play when we have uh, faults on our map or if we have dikes on our map as well. These things tend to create topologic issues with regard to our map. So one of the things I want to do right off the bat is go ahead and pull up the GEMS document on contacts and faults. And I'll direct you to the part where it's talking about contacts and faults and the topology rules associated with it. So we have contacts, contacts and faults, line feature class. These are um, fields and map unit polys, but since polys are built with our contacts, we have to talk about the topology rules that affects these things. And uh, one of the things that I want to talk about right off the bat is what rules are required to be followed in GEMS. And then I'm going to talk about why I have a couple of exceptions here uh, with regard to the, like I said, the internal method for the Bureau of Geology. So right off the bat, lines must not overlap each other means you cannot have a line that is drawn that overlaps another line and lines must not overlap themselves is when a line loops back and crosses and and covers itself another rule is lines must not intersect themselves so must not self intersect and the other one and i would actually put this one here up at the top because this is where I start dealing with topology, because it's one of the areas where we can find and solve problems much faster right off the bat. And that's regarding must not have dangles. And here it clearly says, except for faults and concealed contacts, lines must not have dangles. And I will throw in that in New Mexico, it's quite possible that we have dikes that have a dangle as well, because they can... Um, terminate or disappear under lithology, uh, typically under quaternary lithology where something covers a unit uh, dike uh, could occur. So those are the required rules to be followed by GEMS. At the New Mexico Bureau of Geology, one of the other things I do is lines must not intersect just generic, not just lines must not intersect themselves, but lines must not intersect. And there is a valid reason to do this, but it's not required. And I kind of want to discuss this a little bit in detail because this creates a lot of problems and can cause a lot of digitizing time with regard to fixing the topology of must not intersect. So must not intersect is more there as a guide to validate your geology from the beginning. If digitized in a method much like you draw contacts on a paper map, the must not intersect, lines must not intersect, can 
assist us in finding problems in with regard to what we've digitized. So I'm going to talk about mostly the dangles first and then move to must not intersect and how they work. So I've loaded up a map and I am not certain as to the nature of how the topology is functioning on this map. So bear with me while I find and figure some things out. So one of the first things that we need to do is we need to go ahead and start an editing session because the only way we can have the topology tools available to us is when we start an editing session. So first and foremost, let's go ahead and start an editing session. We're gonna select the geo database that regards um, our data, the, the, the geo database with our data. And then what we want to do is we want to zoom, deselect anything, make sure nothing is selected, and then zoom to the full extent of our map area. This allows us right off the bat, first blush, to be able to validate the topology and look at all of the errors of topology right off the bat. And what we'll do also is look at the rules of topology that I have set up. Currently, contacts and faults, geologic lines, map extent poly, map unit points, and map unit polys. And the rules that we have in play is contacts and faults must not overlap. This is much like the topology in gems. Uh, must not self overlap, must not intersect. We also have contacts and faults must not self intersect. We'll talk about this one in a little bit of detail later. And then um, most importantly, must not have dangles. I find this one to be one of the ones that catches most of our errors within with regard to our geologic map. The other errors that we have, uh, rules that we have in here is uh, map extent poly must be covered by contacts and faults. That means we must cover our entire mapping area map unit polys boundary must be covered by contacts and faults. That means our polygons must be coincident with our contacts. And this comes into play only after we make polygons. And it's the same with this one as well. Map unit polys contains one point from map unit points. And that gives us our label for our polygons. We have some others down here must not uh, polygons must not overlap. Map unit polys must not have gaps. We don't want areas where we've accidentally bumped our polygons to come into play. And that's most commonly the one that shows up with must not gap, have gaps. And then we also have to remember that must not have gaps. Since we have a globe sitting in our data frame, our data view, there is a gap that goes all the way around the world from uh, one side to the other regarding the fact that we have a globe. So because that globe goes all the way around the world, we have a gap outside of our map area. That one can be marked as an exception right off the bat, uh, but only once we have polygons. I've also got geologic lines must not self overlap and geologic lines must not self intersect. This is a check against the system more than anything. Okay, so one of the things that we want to do right off the bat as well is pull up our error inspector. And once we validated the current topology and the current extent, this will allow us to see these errors. And this is the word of caution. We should talk about validate topology in current extent. So if I'm zoomed into the map here and I click validate topology in current extent, it will only validate this area in question, which is why I comment that we should go ahead and zoom to the entire extent of our data and then validate our topology. And then one of the other things that I do as a general principle is I go ahead and uncheck the visible extent only. Because if I select an error, like must not have dangles, and I'm only looking in the visible extent and I say search for these errors, I only see the ones that are in the current extent. So that's one of the things that we need to be cautious of. So if I select a rule, a, a error that is demonstrated in our uh, error inspector, and I press the Z key, that will zoom to that error. I can also right click and say zoom to as well. But I find the Z key is a much faster way of doing it. So right here, we can see that we have a error. And I'm curious why that is sitting there all by itself. So it's all by itself. That gives me pause for a second. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the feature. I'm going to see that it's a line that continues on through here, but it's currently not drawing. 
So likely that means that we have a contact that doesn't have a symbol for it. And sure enough, we look at it and it doesn't. So we have to make some cautious um, analysis here. And we can see that this is an approximately located contact and uh, it's safe to assume that that uh, uh, continues approximately, but this is why topology. These will find these problems for us. Now, we should know that this is probably best caught by looking at the attribute table, but all things considered, this is one of the things that we're looking for. So we can go ahead and type in our code for an approximate contact that is uh, existence is certain and identity is certain, but the location is approximate. Oops. So now I've got that line displaying and sure enough, we can see that that is a dangle. Now that dangle, is that actually a problem? It's off the map area. So this is one of the ones that we can mark as an exception. And this would be true of a fault as well. Faults tend to uh, uh, disappear underneath uh, either lithology or the fault ceases at some point in our map area. This is very common. So one of the things we can do with that is just right click on it and mark as an exception. The other thing we can do is with that selected, if we press our X key, that will mark that as an exception as well. This allows us to very quickly go through the map area and look at things. So it then selects the next rule the next error in line. So I can click Z to zoom to and X to mark that one as an exception as well. And then I could just continue this Z. Ah, a dangle that doesn't close an area. So this is really the error we're looking for with must not have dangles. And this is common. This is one of those things where uh, snapping didn't exactly take effect or we were uh, uh, a little quick to press, press our F2 key to finish the sketch. So this dangle really needs to extend down to our map boundary. So we can right click on it and say extend. And then it pulls up a what is our minimum distance that we think this could extend to to connect to our map boundary. So I'm gonna go ahead and make it longer than I want to. I'm gonna say 100, 1000 meters. And sure enough, I say extend to 1000 meters and it will extend to the point that it reaches the end of our map area or the next nearest line. If we do snap, it'll snap to the next node. And I have the nodes, the, the edit vertices mode selected now. It would have a hard time snapping to the nearest vertice because it would snap over here or over here. One of the things that Arc does now in its very nature is if we do an intersect like these, it will add a node for us at that point of intersection. And this is one of the things that's going to be a little bit time consuming and tedious later on that we want to deal with. So I've marked that one as an, uh, I've extended that contact beyond uh, where it was. So again, I deselect, get into the habit of deselect, validate, turn off visible extent, and then search for errors again. So this is why I turn off the visible extent. So I can see every error, which allows me to then select the next one. Z to zoom to, and I can see I have a dangle here. Now again, this is off the edge of our map, so this is an exception. As is this one, as is this one, as is this one. And basically what we can do with this is just zoom around the map, just pop around the map and get an idea of what we're looking at. So the other thing I wanna talk about is as I was bopping through those, I could tell I was down at the bottom of the map area. But one of the other things we can do is zoom out to an extent that makes us comfortable with being able to actually look at our geologic map and get an idea of what's going on. Oops, I was hoping that would label, and it's not labeling. I want to label off of label. And now we can see our units. So this gives us context for what our maps are doing. And again, we probably have a hidden line here that comes up through here and connects to this unit somehow. So if we select the feature, we can see that that is a extending beyond. We can 
open up our attribute table. So to open up the attribute table, we can either right click open attribute table or we can select the feature, press control and double click that will automatically open the attribute table. And I've currently got it selected so that only the selected features are showing. I'm uncertain as to the nature of this contact. So that's a problem, isn't it? And likely it's a approximate contact based on the context of what we're seeing here. But I would need to contact the author to verify this. Or if you are the author, you would need to validate what this line is actually supposed to be. So I'm going to go ahead and make an assumption. I shouldn't be making this assumption, but for the purpose of topology, I'm going to go ahead and do it. So I'm going to go ahead and call this 01, 01, 03. And we can see now that that is an exception to our topology because it's beyond the map area. So I'm going to mark it as an exception. Now I've been zooming to my rules. But what if the context of this didn't provide me enough information? I could easily zoom out and instead of hitting the Z key to zoom to, I can hit the P key to pan tool. And this will then pan at the zoom extent that I'm at. This will allow me to better get context, the geologic context for our map area. So I can mark that as an exception. I'm going to go back to this one and I'm going to mark that as an exception. And let's look at, oops. I need to go back to that area I was just at because I want to point out a slight problem. So. If I switch to my select, uh, 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 sorry, my fixed topology error tool, with that I can select the topology error and it pulls it up. So I'm going to mark that as an exception. I'm going to select this one. I'm going to mark it as an exception. We also have a slight issue here. The point for this unit right here is actually outside of the map boundary. That means this is not a closed area and therefore this will not make a polygon. And because there is no point in here, this will make a polygon that's null. So we actually wanna go ahead and select this and move that point inside the area that we want to make the polygon. So this brings up a good point. This is the reason why we run topology and why a lot of our topology rules are available to us and they are strong suggestions for you to use. This allows us to look at our map and within the context of what we're working on, make sure that what we've digitized incorporates what will make good polygons or a good geologic map. So having done what I just did by moving this point from here to here, I have ensured that this area will be labeled and create a polygon. So with that, watch what happens now when I validate this in the current extent. This error will move to this. And everyone asks, why is this an error? And it has to do with the rules that we have set up. Currently, this point exists, and we've got a rule that says map unit polys must contain one point from map unit points. So currently, because there are no polygons built, because we're running topology on our lines first, this shows as an error. We should not mark this as an exception yet. We should just go ahead and accept that this is an error because we haven't built polygons yet. It's a very real uh, situation and it's something we need to take into mind. We'll, we'll fix this when we make polygons. But this also brings up another thing. So we're looking at the map and we have an intersection here and here and here. Are these intersections problematic? No, but they are exceptions. So let's go ahead and switch to our must not intersect. So when we're looking at errors of must not intersect, 
one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that as we're digitizing, we can digitize in these intersections that are just fine. There's nothing wrong with them. But this is the reason why the USGS has eliminated this from its topology is because these are not a problem at all. But one of the things that does show up on these maps is that sometimes, oops, sorry, I'm bopping around the map and I don't mean to be. One of the things that we need to keep in mind with these is that sometimes our intersects are a byproduct of how we've digitized our lines. So that's a dangle, that's not an intersect. I'd like to find one of the ones that is not the worst thing in the world, but is somewhat problematic. Another dangle. Okay, so this intersect is a problem that will be resolved by trimming this dangle. So I'm going to demonstrate that really quick. I'm going to select this. Oops, wrong tool. I'm going to select this topology here, and we'll see that this is a dangle. And with this dangle, I can trim it back to the extent of the previous line. So I can say trim. And I'm going to go ahead and say 100 meters. And we can see that it trims. And if I deselect and validate, we'll see that that error goes away too. So again, this is one of the reasons why we have the intersect error. Now that one would have been caught with a dangle. So it's important to recognize the difference between what is a reasonable dangle and what is a problematic dangle. And we have another one here. So that's an easy one to fix. We go ahead and select that. Oops. We go ahead and select that. We go ahead and say trim. It will now remember the distance that we set previously. I can hit enter and it trims it. We want to deselect. We want to validate. And that intersection goes away. So we will find that a lot of the times our intersections correspond to a dangle. In here, two contacts of two different types are presenting as dangles. Oops, are presenting as dangles. But we need to close these two together. So I can select this sketch. And I can either come over to my Create Features to select the appropriate contact and go ahead and close this. Or I can do whatever is appropriate for the context of what it is that I'm doing. Sometimes we can go ahead and select a line we can hit our continue feature tool. And if this actually was the end of the line, we could go ahead and connect the contact here. Because this line doesn't have an orientation, it doesn't have an M value, we can go ahead and right click on the line and flip Whoa. Ah. We can flip the line, and now we start on green, we stop on red. Now when I click the Continue Feature Tool, I could continue that same line down here. I'm looking for a specific type of intersect, though, so that we can discuss this. Perfect. So this intersect is the reason why we look for must not intersect. Because this line continues through units and comes across. So this is the reason why I suggest that you leave must not intersect as a topology rule to make sure that when we're looking at our map, we find these types of problems. It's not the most complex thing in the world, but now we have to ask ourselves, is this supposed to terminate right here?
or does it actually loop here? And if it loops here, why? The other thing that we'll notice as well is there isn't a point in here to call what this unit is when we make polygons. So there is no map unit point in either of these two closed areas that would uh, necessitate points if this is true. So that's one of the reasons why I leave must not have intersects in here. This is a good thing to pay attention to. And as some have suggested, well, what if we planarize our lines? Well, if that were the case, we would never see this problem until after we've made polygons and these two areas would be unlabeled polygons. And then we'd have to come back to our lines, fix the line problem, go ahead and add points if we need to add points, and then go ahead and remake polygons. So if we leave the must not intersect in, we can find these errors before we make polygons. This allows us to quickly find problems before we make polygons. And that's the reason why these rules are in place, in all honesty, is to make sure that we are able to solve all the problems before we make polygons. And it's likely that we're still going to find more po polygon errors, probably with the fact that we're missing points in this area. And we would. We would find those if we planarize the line, but now we've got some problems that we got to deal with. It breaks lines into segments where maybe it's not a necessity to have this broke into segments. And that brings up another point. If this contact is mapping out this unit and does cross other lines, we would want to make sure that it's done with purpose. Um, this is clearly a mistake, right? But we caught this mistake because of the must not intersect errors. So this is something to keep in mind. I think that the must not intersect is a reasonable tool because it prevents us from making polygons before we've checked all of our lines. So really, when we talk about topology, one of the things we need to keep in mind is that the topology allows us to validate our geology before we make polygons. And really, this will save us time in the long run. Going through and fixing all of the must not have intersects can be time consuming. And that's true. It can be time consuming. But it's there for you to validate your geology and prevent problems that show up later on. So one of the things that I think about when I'm digitizing a map or when I'm out mapping is that when drawing lines, when drawing contacts in our GIS, our contacts should actually trace a contact as if you were walking a contact. So if we were walking this contact, we would draw the line the same way as we walked the contact. We would go ahead and go to the point, and at the point that it intersects a line, another contact, we should go ahead and geologically stop it because the other contact breaks the lithology. And that's one of the important things. And there's a couple other things that are going on here is, should some of these be concealed? Is that what's happening? Does this unit go concealed underneath this uh, unit? And it's not likely that it does because this isn't a quaternary unit that it's intersecting. So we've got topoli we've got map problems here. So that's a strong reason why I am a proponent of leaving the must not have intersects in there. So if you can go through your map area quickly and look at topology with an open mind, you can find problems beforehand. And truthfully, topology will take a day, right? And that's not a problem. It does take time, and you have to budget that time in your efforts. It's a reality. The better you plan, the better you map, the better you draw your lines, the less errors you'll have. But let's face it. We create errors. It's just a nature of drawing lines and revising our map is that eventually we can introduce error ourselves. And the best thing we can do is to digitize in a manner that prevents these things, right? But it's not always the easiest scenario. It doesn't always happen that way.
So one of the things to keep in mind with topology is it's not just making sure the lines are good, it's making sure our geology is good. And this is a great example of there's something going on here that really needs to be managed because if I'm not mistaken, this QLS unit covering this area right here means that these should be concealed contacts and they're not concealed. And they continue through a unit in three different ways. So that's why I leave the must not have intersects alone. And everyone says, yeah, but the map itself takes a long time to get rid of the must not have intersects. And that's fairly true. But again, if we digitize with purpose, we would draw our line to here, stop it here, draw in the next segment, stop it here, and then draw in the next segment and continue this all the way through. There's no reason why this line should be broken into these two lines. Does that make sense? This line could be joined to this one. So this is what we're looking for. These types of problems in digitizing can create problems for us, but it gives us the topology, gives us the opportunity to correct these mistakes before we make polygons. So that being said, I'm going to make an edict that it should not be a standard procedure to go ahead and planarize lines because what that does is it breaks it into all these individual segments. Now, it's good in this circumstance, right? It would break it into this segment, this segment, and this segment. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's reality. But when we digitize, but we could have avoided that by digitizing this the correct way, drawing this line, stopping it here, drawing this line, stopping it here, and then drawing this line to continue on. So, it's not the worst thing in the world that this is done this way, but planarizing would have, would prevent us from seeing this as uh, a problem. And like I said, it's not really a problem, but topology gives us the opportunity to review the geology and the lines we have on a map. And contact should reflect the geology. Yes, this contact does come through here. Absolutely, there's no mistaking that it does. But there's nothing wrong with stopping it here, starting a new segment, and starting this segment. So, one of the things that we run into with must not intersect is that a lot of these are exceptions, like these ones right here. So I'd like to propose and show a faster way of dealing with the must not intersect exceptions. Because what we can do is we can select a must not intersect and zoom to. Okay. That one we accept is an exception. So let's go to the next one, zoom. I need to zoom out to get context. Okay, that's an exception. So let's pan to the next one. That's an exception. That's an exception. Oops. That's an exception. That's an exception. That's an exception. So right now I've seen that I've got these six are exceptions. I can select them all right click and mark as an exception. So then I can continue on with the next one. That's an exception. That's an exception. That's an exception. Just using this pan tool, I can go through my list really quick and I can see that all of these are exceptions. So I select them, press X to mark as an exception. I pan to the next one. Ooh, that's not an exception. So let's look at this one. So likely this line, there's a likely, a line here that continues up through, and these are exceptions as well. There's nothing wrong with these intersecting. But again, if we had digitized this in a way that this unit comes to here, stops, comes to here, stops, and then continues on, there's nothing wrong with that. And the other factor is, is likely this is approximate just like this is, so this line can continue through here as well. So at this circumstance, we can either mark these as exceptions, or we can go ahead and split them. And I've got multiple features selected right now, so let's make our map extent poly not selectable. And I can go ahead and mark as an exception. Select this line segment. 
Sorry, map extent poly should not be selectable. And I can split this one as well. So these can either be exceptions or they can be split into segments. Now the planarize tool would have done that for us, but then we would have missed that error that I showed previously where the QLS loops over something. And again, maybe that was supposed to cover that, but really there it presented other problems. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. We saw that that looped on an area, but identified that this should probably be concealed right here, and this should be concealed right here. So again, I, I know I'm belaboring this a little bit, but that's why we shouldn't planarize these, because we can find these problems and correct the line types before we make polygons. So this allows us a quick way of going through and finding the problems, and those are still showing as problems because I split them. Let's go ahead and code these correctly. Now that we've coded them and marked them as exceptions, now we can see that we have dangles here as well. So again, this might have been caught in searching for dangles. And that's why I suggest that you start with your dangles, solve the dangles first. That will likely get rid of most of your must not intersect problems. So we've got some weird, um, contact issues going on here that I'm going to ignore for the time being and pretend that I'm not seeing these. Um, but if you do see something like this, it means likely that your map boundary line has moved. Or your map extent poly has moved. And it's likely that because I had it selected, select a bowl, I have bumped this, just like this. This is a common occurrence. So it's one of the other things to be careful of. Make sure that you have the features that you want to be editing as being selectable. Or one of the things we could have done right from the get-go is make those not draw. So I'm going to stop my edits. I'm not going to save my edits. And sure enough, that was a byproduct of me bumping it. So one of the things that we can do right off the bat is when we start our editing session, we can come to contacts and faults, start editing our lines, but let's make things that we don't anticipate editing non-selectable, like map extent poly, and also our map boundary line, which is currently not drawing. We can make it not selectable. Or we can also turn those off from display. That will prevent us from selecting those as well. So now I can only select Oops, I've got contacts and false locks. Now I can only select those features that I actually intend to edit. And now, because I don't have map extent poly selected or selectable, it's hard for me to bump and move that on accident like I did. So this is one of the best recommendations that I can make. For the most part, we would, again, Start our editing session. Zoom to the extent of our entire map. Validate topology. Switch to our must not have dangles and solve all of those problems. Uncheck select visible extent only, search, 
and solve these dangles. That is the best thing that I can recommend right off the bat. So the methodology that I just demonstrated with regard to going through and selecting multiple errors at a time is still valid. So I'm going to go ahead and select this. I'm going to pan to I'm going to zoom in a little bit so that we have context of what we're looking at, but we're not looking too far out. And if I hit pan, I can see that's an exception. Select the next one. Pan to that one. That's an exception. Pan to that one. That's a problem. So then I can come back to these two, right click and mark as an exception, or hit my X key and mark as an exception. Right click on this one, extend, and snap to. And again, now it's highlighted the next one. So let's keep going. We can select the next one. That's an exception. Oop, I'm not sure about that one, so let's pan to that. Oh, that one's an exception. Select that one. Pan two, that one's an exception. Pan two, that one's an exception. Pan two, that one's an exception. So I can select these, mark as X, and then I've marked those as exceptions. So very quickly, you can go through the document and not take much time to be able to correct all of the problems that we're seeing. So there's an exception, that's an exception. That is likely an exception, and I can tell by the double square Pan 2. Ooh, that's not an exception. So we have to deal with that one. But that means that the previous three are exceptions. We now have this one. We can go ahead and extend. And then pan to our next selection. Ooh, I'm not sure about this one. So let's zoom out. Oh, that's an exception. P for pan. We talked about these. That's an exception, so we could just mark it as an exception. But that's how you can quickly go through topology. And truthfully, a thousand errors of topology will probably take you a couple of hours to deal with. But that's all we're talking about is a couple of hours. And when you take into consideration the fact that topology and the process of validating topology can allow you to better find the problems within your map the more likely you are to correct problems before you make polygons. So that is my strongest recommendation. So we talked about dangles, we talked about intersections. Let's talk up next about our self-intersects or self-overlaps. I don't know that this map has any, no it does not. Okay, so let's draw in a self-overlap. I recognize this is a bad thing to do, but I'm drawing my contact. I come to the edge of the map. I click a vertice. I can stop here so that I don't have my uh, uh, intersect error. Snap to the endpoint. Continue on. Oops, I'm not going to be able to do that very well. So let's do one thing right quick. Okay, let's talk about an issue that shows up. A lot of the times when we're drawing like a uh, terrace or something like that, we want to draw and come back and close this line, but I can't snap to it. So I've got to come up with some creative way of doing this. I can go ahead and hit F2. I can go ahead and continue my sketch. I can hit the uh, button, click to my snapped location and hit F2. And now I've closed this. But there's a functionality in Arc where we can snap to our sketches. So now, with Snap to Sketch available to me, I can snap to a closed area and close it in one foul swoop. So that will save some efforts too. But one of the things that happens when we're drawing our contacts in is that we can accidentally, with that turned on, snap back to a sketch that we've already drawn. Now if I validate my topology, I've got this must not self overlap error. And this is now highlighting that overlap and we can right click on it and say simplify. And what that does is it will uh, simplify the lithology, the, the, the contact 
to see that it doesn't have any overlaps. And that didn't work. So there's one other thing that we can do with regard to that is select the features and then switch to our edit vertices and we can see that it starts on green and stops on red but we still have green so that tells us that it continued past and then back on itself. So what we can do in this circumstance is go ahead and in our edit vertices tool we can select those offending vertices Oops. Ah. We can select those offending vertices and delete them. And unfortunately, it's selecting the vertices underneath it. So this would be one of those circumstances where we might have to redraw this line. Or one of the tricks that I've learned is if we switch to our edit vertices, We can move the vertices out of the way. And now we can see that it loops this way and then back on itself. But now we can select these and delete them. And because it's still there, because we haven't finished, we can snap back to those locations, deselect, validate, and now we've fixed our topology error. So that's a self overlap. The must not overlap is if I were to do this. This one is much easier to fix. So. We have drawn a line that overlaps, so if we validate, we can see that we've got an overlap here. So if we switch to our must not overlap tool, we can use the subtract function. So if I select that error, it shows that that is a problem. And we can go ahead and say subtract, and it will ask us which one we want to subtract. Do we want to subtract the segment from this line or from this line? And it makes most sense if this really is a terrace or something like that that is supposed to be self-closed that we should, de we should subtract from this line this segment. And when I click OK, it goes away. We validate. That error goes away. This line now goes from here to here and stops. So that is the must not overlap tool. One of the warnings is don't forget to save your edits periodically. Now, I'm not going to do this. I have made this database a, a copy of uh, one of the early databases. Uh, but, you know, you'd want to go along and periodically go ahead and um, save your edits so that you don't lose the work that you have done should ARC crash on you. Okay, let's look at must not self intersect now. This is likely a mistake in digitizing. And I don't mean to say that this shouldn't happen because it's <laughs> it is certainly one of the things that happens on a map regularly. And I find it more often than not with uh, regard to streaming. Um, I love streaming. It is one of the things that I use on a regular basis. I absolutely adore it. Uh, it does come with a slight bit of problem. Um, but it can happen otherwise, too. So one of the things that we can do is we're drawing our line. And we go to click, and then we go to double click to finish the sketch, and we've done that. So now we have a self-intersect. And if I click validate, we'll see. Now let me do a better example. We go to close our line and if we're zoomed out we don't realize that we've self-intersected but when we validate we see the self-intersect 
So this is a common occurrence. I mean, let's just be honest with it. It doesn't happen that often, but it does happen. It, it's it's part of digitizing. And we can see very easily that, oh, okay, if we had dealt with those two dangles, we would get rid of the self-intersect. So let's demonstrate that. If I were to select, the, oops, sorry. If I were to select the right tool, <laughs> if I select that, we'll see that that's a dangle. I go ahead and trim that. And it failed because I'm not close enough. So let's extend our trim a little bit more. Let's say 500 meters. And it failed again. So it's not recognizing where it needs to trim back to. So we can go ahead and select the vertices. Double click to enter edit vertice mode. Oops, wrong function. Double click to select enter vertice mode. Select the vertex. Select this vertex. And, oops, delete those two vertices, deselect, validate. And that's one of the cadence things that I'm going to talk about. Deselect, validate. When you're editing lines manually and you've got one selected, make sure you deselect, then validate. And you can see that if we had dealt with the two dangles, we would get rid of the error that we have of the self-intersect. But I've noticed two more. So let's go ahead and zoom to those and see what happens. So this is a self-intersect right here. So this line did exactly what I suggested. It starts, comes up, loops around, and then closes. But let's talk about this in its very nature. This, to me, is a problem of digitizing not a problem of digitize of digitizing maybe not in the same way of walking the contact that that i commented on earlier so in order to digitize this probably the best way to digitize this line is is draw this line in we can see that it switches its nature here and becomes uh certain and uh accurate located here but it continues through here separating this unit from this unit this unit from this unit and this unit from this unit so what we probably should have done is gone ahead and drawn from here to here to here up and around to here and then finish that sketch then drawn this contact again like we're walking the contact you can only walk one contact at a time and to avoid the self-intersection instead of drawing this then drawing another contact then closing that one we should have just gone ahead and drawn this in as a different contact there's nothing wrong with this honestly truthfully there is nothing inherently wrong with this but it does imply that this contact is one continuous contact and the reality is is geologically they're they're not really the same contact are they but that's what this kind of implies and there again there's nothing wrong with this but the implication is that this contact is somehow unique in that it uh, separates multiple units instead of being a contact that separates a unit and then comes through. And again, I would argue that probably this contact starting here should be digitized to here, stopped, digitized to here, stopped, then digitized to here because they intersect different units. Now, that's uh, a little pedantic, and I do recognize that. I, I'm, I'm arguing from the standpoint of geologically, there's a complex nature to these. And that's how I would tend to digitize them. I would draw this segment, this segment, this segment, or draw this, and then recognize that this is a separate contact. And the reality is, is being that this is a fan, likely, more precisely, there's probably a concealed contact here. That would probably be the better way of handling that. But this brings up that issue of self-intersecting. If this was digitized in a way 
that prevented that, we would never have to check this rule and deal with the fact that it's self-intersecting. So the way you digitize can go a long way into preventing these problems. And again, we would have solved this problem in the dangle, but the nature of this contact the way it is probably wasn't digitized the way it, it in a way that makes the most sense, right? So if I fix this dangle, let me do this really quick. Editor, save edits. I'm going to go ahead and fix this dangle. By going ahead and trimming. And again, it can't trim because we're trimming it to itself. So now we've got to go ahead and select the vertices. Select the vertex in question and delete that vertex. Deselect and validate. And now both of those errors go away. But the very nature of it could have been prevented with snapping turned on drawing the contacts as I suggested, either drawing this contact in or drawing this contact, this contact, and then this contact in, and then finishing up with this, that would have prevented that. So let's go back to that, have those two back in. The other thing that we could do really quickly is split this here. Now I've split it into this loop and this line, and now I can easily come in and still have to delete this vertice. But now we've drawn the contact for this unit separate from these units. And again, it's a little pedantic. I do recognize that. But it's it's the discussion of what is happening is what's important. But now, why is that showing as an intersect? Oh, it's showing as a dangle means it didn't actually close to itself. Ah. So that was a separate error altogether. So that one was never actually closed to this uh, music note. <laughs> But again, this is why I start with must not have dangles. That really is one of the best ways to find problems altogether. And the reality is, is honestly, if you've got snapping turned on, most of these problems will be resolved with must not have dangles. It is so common that a dangle creeps in by accident. And most of your errors in topology will be fixed with regard to dangles. I mean, quite honestly, one of the other things that I find uh, happens, and I want to discuss this as well, is in our layer properties, we can go ahead and say that we want our reference scale to draw at 24K. And if you have this set up, now it's really hard to see the errors, isn't it? I mean, even if we turn off the topology so that we can see what's going on, we can't see the errors. And as we zoom in, this does no benefit for us whatsoever to be able to see. So I do a mix. Commonly, I have it displaying at 24K. Sometimes I have it displaying at 10K. And sometimes I have it just do whatever you need to do at scale. And very easily, when we have it set like that, we can see our problems. I recognize that a lot of the times when we're looking at our map, we like looking at it at the scale we're ultimately going to be displaying it at because it helps us to visualize what we can see here. So this is an important distinction to make sure that we make uh, sense of in the grand scheme of things. When we're zoomed out to 24K, it looks beautiful, right? But as we zoom in and we're trying to fix problems, problems are obscured by the lines that they're physically drawing.
So that's one of the other things that I comment on regularly is that, you know, go ahead and change this occasionally to a scale that makes sense for what you're working with so that you can see some of these problems or just let it set it to the zoom itself. I understand switching back and forth is going to be a thing that you're just going to want to do. So there's nothing wrong with that. It is perfectly acceptable to go ahead and zoom in to an extent that makes uh, sense. And you can tell here we're at almost one to one before we can actually really see that dangle. Here at one to four, it doesn't look that bad. Here at one to eight, now it doesn't even look like there's a dangle. But topology can obscure what we're looking at. So that's one of the reasons why I'm commenting on the reference scale. Uh, when we're looking at reference scales that were actually with the map, that match the map scale, let's put it that way, uh, that can obscure what we're looking at entirely and doesn't provide much help. So my recommendation is instead of setting this or recognize that you can set this at any time while you're working to be able to do it. So when working with topology, I tend to set it to the zoom, let it let the zoom level force what I'm looking at. That really makes a lot of difference in the grand scheme of things uh, regarding uh, what we're looking at, if that makes sense. Now that we have our lines fixed, uh, I'm going to do air quotes there that you can't see, but you know, once we have our lines fixed, then what we'll do is we'll go ahead and make polygons. And once we've made polygons, we're likely to find some more errors with regard to our polygon errors. So these ones can be ignored. Map extent poly must be covered by contacts and faults. That one's fine. Because the map extent poly does, is, is covered by our, our, our contacts and faults. And that's because map extent poly is what creates our map boundary line. Let me turn this off so we can see. It creates our map boundary line. And then, so if I turn off contacts and faults, let's do it this way. Let's start over again. Our map extent poly, let's do it with a fill so we can see. Our map extent poly builds our map boundary line. And our map boundary line is then copied and pasted into contacts and faults. So we have the bounding condition of our map. Then when we make polygons from our points, we have some rules that come into play with regard to that. So we've talked about map extent poly must be coincident with contacts and faults. And that's just a check to make sure we haven't moved our contacts and faults. away from our map boundary line. So now we can see that our map extent poly is not coincident with our map itself. So that's what that rule deals with. And again, some of these aren't required. I recognize that. But again, it's a check against the system. It's a, it's a validation that to verify that we have done what we believe we have done is correct. It's just a check against the system. These aren't meant to punish. They're not meant to be done for the sake of being done. They're not rules for the sake of rules. They are rules for the sake of just making sure that we are generating the best product we can. And if we are, like this one, more often than not, it never comes up. It's not something that we end, ever end up having to deal with. Okay, map unit polys must be covered by the boundary of contacts and faults. So this is exactly the same, but validates whether or not we've moved a polygon or all polygons, or if we've moved all contact, a contact or fault, or all contacts and faults. So again, these two work exactly the same. It just makes sure that our map area is in our map area because it's too easy to accidentally bump something. Okay, 
The other one is map unit poly contains one point from map unit points. And I'm going to go ahead and zoom into this area right here. Because right here, when we make polygons, this will be one polygon. And if we look, we have one, two, three points. Now, everyone says, well, but those are all the same points, so what's the problem? There isn't a problem in this circumstance. It's not a problem at all. But one of the things that does happen that we have to be careful against is that we label a polygon and actually put the wrong point in here. So it's never bad to have two points in so long as they agree with each other. Where it becomes problematic is if we have two points in an area that disagree with each other. And I'm trying to remember on this map where that one showed up. So forgive me for a second while I search for a conflict that was present in these. can't remember exactly where it was. That one's good. Q ah, here it is. Here it is. So we have a map unit of QAL and we have a map unit of QAL over QF. Now the problem is this one is, is that these two are not the same thing. And this has a label where a map unit should be. So this still should be QAL, but the label, if this is true, should be QAL for them, excuse me, the map unit should be QAL, but the label should be QAL over QF. And this is what we're talking about here, because this would get labeled with this one because of the way ARC makes polygons. This unit, this point would be intersected first when making this polygon, and this one would be ignored. So it would be labeled, it would be mapped as a map unit of QAL over QF versus QAL. And that's a problem because now we have two conflicting units that don't agree with each other. So this is why we go ahead and say must have one point because in one point we would see this error when we create the polygon and then we can go and find this problem and solve this. Is this really QAL or is it QAL over QF or whatever the case may be? Now, this seems like kind of a weird one to talk about, but again, this is the label. This is the actual map unit. And because there are so many dangles, I'm reticent. That's the reason why I'm not making polygons from this, uh, is because there are quite a few problems in here. I was thinking there was one more that I wanted to talk about that is the same problem. Yep, here it is, here it is, here it is. JTL, JTG, no, oh, there's the contact. Okay, never mind. That one's good. I feel like there was one more exactly like that where it wasn't separated by a unit. And then we have this one. So there is no amount of topology that would ever catch this problem. JTL separated by a contact from a JTL unit. So there is no topology that would catch this problem right here. So that this contact splits these two units, which we know contacts can't split a similar unit. There should be a key bed or something else in there that, that exemplifies that. And we know this isn't real. So there's no topology that can catch this. And I will reiterate then that this is the reason why we do not planarize. Because 
This line stops here. This line stops here. All right, goes through. But because this terminates here, if we had planarized this, This would be broken into a segment like this. This would be broken into a segment like this. And likely, you would draw this contact and continue through, and you would draw this contact and continue through. This would then show up as an intersection. And then we would see that this unit is separated by this unit. It shouldn't be, and we can delete that contact. So that is one of the reasons why I tend to leave must not intersect in is if you're drawing this like a contact that goes all the way through, like you're walking the contact that separates it, you might find that problem. Now, if you follow, like I said, you would have drawn this contact, you would have stopped here and you would have drawn this contact, but you don't have to because this contact shouldn't split this. So the reality is, is if you were walking this contact, you would probably draw this contact all the way through, then when this line is drawn as one segment, this would show up as a intersect. So that's, again, I, I realize I'm belaboring this a little bit and it's a little pedantic to discuss, but this is the circumstance for must not intersect. This also is a problem too, because we have two lines that are parallel with each other, but this one touches this one. So that should be an intersect as well. And it's not showing up as an intersect. That's interesting. Maybe it doesn't actually touch. It doesn't actually touch. Okay, so that's why. But this is a common occurrence that I see as well is An accident of digitizing where sometimes your lines will do this and then if we validate then we have that intersection now we can find this now again we'd find this problem in an unlabeled polygon here and an unlabeled polygon here but the intersection will find it before we make polygons So I hope this helps. I hope this discussion provides you with context for how to work with and deal with topology. So let's do a little recap really quick because we've covered a lot of information. So I'd like to do a little checklist that covers the information we're discussing. First and foremost, we'll load in our topology. We'll start an editing session. We'll zoom to the full extent of our map, and then we'll go ahead and click validate. Then what we'd want to do is go ahead and deselect all of the lines or polygons or points that we don't want to deal with. We can either make them not selectable or we can make them not visible. So we could go ahead and turn off all of the layers that don't apply to the topology that we're working with. and work with topology here. Or we can go ahead to the selectable features and make those features that we're not editing not selectable. This way we prevent ourselves from accidentally bumping a line and moving it off of where we mapped it at. And I hope that's clear. If not, feel free to ask the question of what I mean by bumping a line. I think I demonstrated that, but it's one of the things that does happen. Okay, so once we've only got the features that we're actually editing topology with, either visible or not visible or selectable and not selectable, then we can go ahead and uh, start working with topology by editing our topology. So we would go ahead and validate, pull up our air, expect, air inspector, uncheck visible extent only 
And then I recommend working through these very systematically, starting with must not have dangles. Search for all your dangles, solve all of the dangle problems. Come to your must not self overlap, solve all your self overlapping problems, must not self intersect, solve all your self intersecting problems. Come to um, overlap. And then, if you leave this in, your must not intersect problems. Now, again, as we showed, GEMS doesn't require most of these rules, but these are checks against the system. And if you've digitized correctly, most of these will not have errors. But the catch is, is if they do have errors, go ahead and correct them. And just recognize that topology in itself will probably take a day of working through. As you get more accustomed to working with topology and how to solve these problems, that could probably be brought down to uh, half a day or something like that. Now, of course, that also depends on the complexity of your map. The more complex it is, the more detailed it is, the more likely you're going to have problems that you're going to have to resolve. Once you've got all your line topology errors fixed, now you can come to your polygon errors. And really, the only polygon error that you should really have a problem with is map unit poly contains one point. So once you've made polygons, go through the map and find all of the map units with more than one point and either mark as an exception or delete the extra points or delete the erroneous points like we saw up here. Uh, all the rest of the map unit poly errors will likely go away, except for must not have gaps. And again, must not have gaps. There's always a gap around the outside of your mapped area because we're dealing with a globe. And there is a gap between this edge of the map going around the globe to this edge of the map. And then this edge of the map going north, coming around the globe from the south and this edge. So there's always going to be a gap outside of your mapped area. And you can just mark that as an exception. Uh, what it'll also find with regard to map unit polys must contain one point from map unit points is unlabeled polygons. So an area error will show up in the polygons that don't have a point. And these will be your unlabeled polygons. So you could open the attribute table of your map unit polys, sort by map unit, and double click to where it sorts them to where the null values come in first. And then you can select the first one and go through and fix those problems. The best way to fix that problem is to add the map unit point and then change the map unit entry so it has a value in here. Don't forget that you can Z to zoom to a selected air or P to pan to a selected air at a specific zoom level. So P will maintain the current zoom level. Z will zoom in to a scale that's reasonable for what it's looking at. And it has to do with the map extent area. Don't forget to go through and fix a couple edits. So, so go through and find all the ones that are exceptions, select them, mark them as an exception as a group. Don't forget to save your edits. You can set your snapping tolerance to be a higher level or lower level. So let's look at that really quick too. I, I forgot to mention this, but with regard to snapping, if I I'm going to set my snapping to something kind of ridiculous. So let's do uh, 75. So snapping now will happen over 75 pixels. So if I move around, we can see how quickly it snaps to other areas. That's 75 pixels on the monitor. So very easily we can set that. And you can set it very high or you can set it very low and it requires a more precise move to actually get it to snap. See how much closer I have to be to get that to snap? Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's gonna be annoying because the precision with which you have to move your mouse or your pen or whatever can be a little tedious, but it's something to keep in mind that your snapping 
options will allow you to adjust that. By default, it is about 10. I tend to operate around five, somewhere in there. That tends to be reasonable. And it gives me the ability to place my points precisely. If I'm editing a point per se, I can more precisely do it without having to worry about it snapping to a vertice that I don't want it to. Once you've fixed all of your line errors, then fix all of your polygon errors. Uh, I know this has been a long video. I hope this has been helpful. I recognize that there are probably exceptions and possibly questions to this, but it is my recommendation that as these things come up, go ahead and ask me questions. By all means, ask anyone on the team questions, and uh, we'll go ahead and help you identify problems or uh, some of the ways that we fix some of these problems. Um, but again, the best thing you can do is digitize to the best of your ability from the beginning, avoiding overlapping areas unless it's intentional. And while you're drawing that overlapping area, if it's required, make sure to go ahead and finish up doing what you're supposed to be doing. And that's, I'm talking specifically about this problem right here. So if this really does cover this, go ahead and after you recognize that it covers it, go ahead and split this and then code these as um, concealed contacts. So let's do one more thing that I find really helpful. I'm going to go ahead and select this line. I'm going to split it into two segments. Three segments, excuse me. I'm going to do the same thing here. And now we split this. And if this is truly two concealed contacts, select them both, come to the attributes tab, select both line segments, and right here, very quickly now, I can hit 01, 01, 08, 07, and I've now made them concealed contacts both in one foul swoop. So that's another thing. You can use the attribute table to your advantage in the fact that if all of these lines are the same, we can go ahead and select them and then code them as appropriate dynamically. So I hope that helps. If you have any other questions or you have any specifics that you'd like to talk about, that's great. I have no problem with that. Please contact me and we'll discuss it. It is likely that we will follow the USGS discussion of topology. We will probably be eliminating, must not intersect, because of the fact is if you digitize correctly, you don't necessarily need must not intersect. So it's one of the things that's going to speed things up a little bit in the fact that your dangles should solve all of your must not intersect problems if you're digitizing diligently. So that's one of the comments that I'm going to make right off the bat is if you're doing good digitizing and you're walking contacts and you're stopping contacts when you intersect other map units, you won't ever have to worry about lines must not intersect. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we'll probably eliminate that from the topology. But it's also one of the words of caution or warning or mention that I'm going to bring up is there's nothing wrong with having that rule in there. It will force you to look at your map. And let's face it, the best thing that you can do while working on topology is validate your geology. Look at the geologic units. Look at the geology that you're presenting. And the more instances that you have to look at these things, the more likely you're f going to find problems or potential uh, digitizing mistakes. So again, this isn't meant to be punitive. It's meant to be a tool. And if you're using the tool correctly, you can correct a lot of your problems from the beginning. And I agree, this is a tedious, time-consuming process but it is critical to the production of a good quality geologic map. And that's why I say this is not punitive. Topology is not meant to be punitive. Think about it as an opportunity to use the tool at your disposal 
for the purpose it's intended to make sure your contacts and faults and dikes and polygons and map units are done correct or as best as can be done from the beginning. It makes building the map, the last couple steps of building the polygons much faster, and it'll prevent the likelihood that you have to make polygons 20 and 30 times. And that's really what we're looking at. That is more time saving than going through and verifying lines must not intersect. Making polygons over and over is more time consuming than finding those problems from the beginning. So I hope this video has been informative. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Thank you very much and have a great day.